greet you in Jesus' name. Uh, it's good to gather with the saints. It is great to gather with the saints, and so I'm glad that you're uh, here this morning and we have this opportunity to worship together the God who is above all gods, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, our Deliverer, the anchor of our hope. Um, so I recently had surgery on my nasal passage. Uh, yesterday I had surgery again. Yesterday, it was actually the day before, um, on my forehead. You know the guys who have substantial scars across their face, they, you pay more attention to them, right? So uh, think about Al Capone or Frankenstein. You know, people listen when they say something. Uh, no, but that's, that's not the reason. The doctor thought it might be a good idea to open things up and have a look. And, uh, but there was nothing to worry about, he said. He didn't find anything when he looked inside there. And I mean, I could have told him he didn't need to have surgery to, have, to do that, right? I, I could have shown him this way, just shown him this simple test. <laughs> nothing to worry about. <laughs> I have entitled the message this morning, A Word to the Wise. And we're continuing our study in 1 Corinthians, chapter 1, uh, beginning at verse 18. And it's very fitting in this week of what we call Lent, or leading up to Holy Week here, uh, leading up to Good Friday where Jesus was crucified, and uh, of course the, the very hope of every Christian, the hope of the resurrection um, that we celebrate next Sunday. So today would be Palm Sunday commemorates the triumphal entry of Jesus into the city of Jerusalem where he was warmly received and shortly after, but a few days after, crucified by those same people who cheered him on. And it's very fitting that uh, in this morning's uh, message we're, we're touching on the importance of wisdom, the right kind of wisdom, but also a focus upon the cross. Because the hope of every believer is ultimately a cross. And it's, it's something that really causes the world, those who don't know Jesus, it causes them to scratch their heads. I mean, they have pondered this. They have wondered, what is it with those sick Christians that they are so excited about blood, about people being nailed to crosses and dying? What is with those fanatical Christians? And, you know, really, if we had no understanding, if we had no grasp of the spiritual depth, the truth of these things, then we would have to say, you know, the wives of the world probably make a pretty good point. But the truth is that the reality, the spiritual truth of what Christ has done, the joy that we find in our Savior's death, um, is something that has to be spiritually discerned. It is spiritually understood by those who have been spiritually, made spiritually alive through the gift of the Holy Spirit residing within them. See, these things are foolishness, the Scripture says, to those that perish, to those who don't know Him. So when we rejoice in the blood, the shed blood of Jesus Christ, and our Savior, God Himself in Christ, being fastened to a cross, dying a horrible death for our salvation, we rejoice in these things. We rejoice in that He paid the penalty that was ours. And so this <laughs> is what we consider this morning. And I'd like you to give some thought this morning with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning at verse 18. And 18, verse 18 kind of lays this all out for us as we begin um, this morning. We'll, uh, we'll read over the entire portion, 18 through 31, and then we'll go back and uh, pull it apart. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning at verse 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. For it is written... I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? 
Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. Unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see, for you see your calling, brethren. Are there not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called? But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of this world to confound the things which are mighty and base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. So far the reading of God's word. Would you bow with me again in prayer? Oh, Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, our hope, our rock, our deliverer, the very wisdom of God revealed to us. And we pray by the gift of your Holy Spirit that you would speak to each heart, to each mind, that you would grant our understanding insight to these things which you have done, the depth, the width, the height, the breadth of the very love of God, that it would be displayed here again this morning and that we would receive it and take it to heart and mind. And we pray that the result would be service for the honor and glory of your name. It's in your name that we ask this, Jesus. Amen. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. It doesn't make any sense. Now think about it. Now unto us that are saved, it is the power of God. We preach the cross and we rejoice in a cross. But those who are dying who don't know the power of the cross, they don't know the purpose of the cross, they think, you guys are preaching about the cross and you find hope in this instrument of death? You think you get life out of something that kills? What is wrong with you guys? You Christians are berserk. <laughs> and they're absolutely right. They're absolutely right. We, have, we are out of our minds. But that's why the scripture says that let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Be ye all of the same mind, not your own mind, but in the mind of Christ. We have lost our minds, and we have received the very mind of the Lord. That's why we can rejoice in a cross that to them makes absolutely no sense. You guys find hope and life from a source that is an instrument of death, a cross, death, the shedding of blood. I mean, really, this, is, this sounds sadistic. It's, it's nasty. But for us, it's hope-filled and brings us joy unspeakable and full of glory. Those that perish is a reference to unbelievers, those who lack eternal life. And it is no wonder that those who lack life would find the cross, which is an instrument of death, foolish as far as its life-giving potential goes. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. This is the reality. Many of us, we've been at the place where we have questioned many of the things of God. In our own wisdom, we've done the math and figured out that, you know, this doesn't seem to make sense. I can't put all of these things together in my mind. It just doesn't add up. 
and God takes the wisdom of the world and he destroys it. It won't compute to the natural man, to the natural mind, to the human perspective. And then there's an invitation that God extends in verse 20. He extends an invitation to, to the wise. Where is the wise? You know who the wise are? They are the experts, the professionals in the world. Where is the scribe? Where is the writer? Where is the author of esteem? Where is the disputer? Bring out all the debaters, all the philosophers, all those who study every thought and question. Where are these wise of the world? And he asks another question. Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? You bring out the best experts in the world, the greatest professionals, those who have studied all their lives to come to an understanding of how everything is, of where to find purpose, those who have written extensively about the experiences of man, those who are effective in debating and asking questions and thoroughly searching things through. But what have they been able to answer as far as God is concerned? They fall flat. You know what they've come up with? Wonderful explanations of everything like evolution, a cosmic bang that no one knows what the source of was that just made everything out of nothing by mistake. An explosion that fixed something rather than breaking it. Makes a lot of sense. Cosmic soup, because you have to start somewhere. And a bowl of soup's a good place to start. This is what experts and professionals and philosophers and writers and authors, this is what they come up with and have simply chosen as their theory to teach as truth, as fact. Theories as fact. Remarkable. Isaiah 29, verse 14, it says, Therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, even a marvelous work and a wonder, for the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid. The wisdom of the world falls short, and it won't provide us what we're looking for, but God will do a work, and he will do a work in such a way that it will stir the entire world of wisdom. It will upset them. It will trouble them and bother them, and they will work all the harder to come up with new theories, explanations, excuses, if you will, to deny the existence of God, who has revealed himself in the hearts of minds of those who believe. Back to our passage in verse 21. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. Isn't this true? You speak to the wisest of the world, and in almost every case, they will deny the existence of God. Do you know that it's, and, and you know this, you know this because you've been there. It's very inconvenient to believe in a God who has created, who rules over the nations, to whom you will ultimately be accountable to. It's, it's rather inconvenient, isn't it? It's not very helpful for the agenda that my flesh has. Because my flesh has an agenda, and if you have a pulse this morning, your flesh has an agenda as well. And it's not convenient to have to answer to an all-righteous holy God. It's very inconvenient. It creates a problem with my flesh. And so it is the wisest of this world. It's not convenient for them to recognize that there is a God. They don't know God, or at least they won't confess that there is a possibility of a God. It doesn't fit with what they're after. The wisdom of God, after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. The most understanding you can grab and garner, muster from this world, will not reveal God. But it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. 
Now let's clarify. Foolish preaching doesn't reveal God. Foolish preaching isn't the answer. But the type of preaching he's talking about is the preaching, uh, the preaching of the cross. He said that in uh, verse 18, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. So this foolishness of the preaching of the cross is how he has designed to reveal himself, is how he has shown the wisdom of God displayed in this world that misses him because of its own wisdom. It is through the foolishness of preaching or the preaching of the cross in verse 18 that saves them that believe. And is it really any surprise? Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9, we read, For my thoughts, the Lord says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So this is helpful. If you want to compare yourself with God, I mean, you both have thoughts. That's a good place to start. God has thoughts. We have thoughts. God has ways. We have ways. But there is a difference between our ways and God's ways. Our ways are the paths on the earth, and God's ways are the highways <laughs> as far as the heaven separates the earth. This is the distance, the space between our ways and God's ways, our thoughts and his thoughts. So is it any wonder that the world in all its wisdom has not been able to grasp or attain unto the wisdom of God? It simply can't reach. Simply can't reach. They cannot grasp it. It requires a renewed mind. It requires a renewed mind. It's a spiritual truth that your physical wisdom cannot attain unto. Verse 22, for the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. The Jews require a sign. You know that the Jews, they knew God. They were aware of the Lord and his working in years past. They had a history with the Lord. They were God's chosen people. But you know the issue with the Jews, as Paul lays out here, says that they require a sign. You know, in Matthew chapter 12, beginning at verse 38, this is what we read about Jesus. In Jesus' day, in the response of the scribes and Pharisees, then certain of the scribes and Pharisees, Matthew 12, verse 38, they answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. You prove yourself. Show us who you, who you are by some miraculous sign. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. And there shall no sign be given it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. Now Jonas being another name for Jonah. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The Jews sought after a sign. And isn't it a great wonder? Think about the 10 plagues in Egypt. Wouldn't that have been something to witness? Frogs out of nowhere. Flies and gnats. I mean, it sounds like the summer. We have a little stream flowing in the bottom of our yard. And I can't imagine what it would be like if that stream was suddenly flowing blood. That would be a little disturbing. Darkness, so dark, the scripture says you could feel the darkness. It was so dark. Disease in the cattle, destructive hail, uh, the death of the firstborn, and all of these different plagues, ten of them in total. These Jews liked these miraculous signs. God, prove yourself. And then these things for proof. What about the parting of the Red Sea? It would have been pretty neat, right? 
Red Sea parts and you're walking along and you have this heap of water on either side. Like it's almost like, have you ever been to an aquarium and you walk through that, that tunnel thing and you see the fish going by? I wonder if those heaps of water, if they would have seen the fish, like that would have been interesting. It's like an, the first aquarium visit in the scriptures. So they walked through the Red Sea on dry ground. Do you remember that, uh, that white stuff, those little honey wafers that fell from the sky? What was that called? Manna. Angel's food. Now that's a descriptive word. I don't think angels sit around opening their bags of manna chips. And <laughs> but it was a way that it was described in the scriptures, maybe using some poetic language. But this fell from heaven like dew, and it was collected. Um, incredible. Miraculous. But like we tend to do, the Jews did the same thing. Ah, we get kind of tired of the miraculous, and they started complaining and whining. So what did the Lord do? He sent them some meat. Quail. Quail out of the sky. More quail. I mean, they, it piled up on the ground, so they went and collected it and stuffed their faces with all the meat that they could get. Another miracle. Water from a rock. I've gotten water from a sponge before when it was pre-soaked. I don't know how you get it from a rock. Jericho walls came down. Do you remember Joshua's long day? When the day continued as about another 24 hours approximately is what is suggested around a full day, that extended day, so he could win the battle. You remember when the earth opened up and swallowed up Korah and the others who complained against Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. The earth swallowed them up. I don't know if that was an earthquake, was it a sinkhole, a combination of both, I don't know. It's a judgment of God in a miraculous way. What about Elijah's showdown on Mount Carmel? Pretty interesting, right? That would have been amazing to see the altar just completely devoured by fire. All the rocks, everything, completely consumed. The prophets of Baal, 400 of them. What about Elisha's healing of Naaman who had leprosy? Would have been incredible to see. Or, or this, as mentioned already, what about Jonah and his all-inclusive three-day cruise in the whale of a fish? Or in the belly of a fish, rather. You know, that there's a, an account about a man named James Bartley. He participated in a whaling expedition off the Falk, Falkland Islands in 1891. Bartley's boat was attacked by a whale, and he went overboard and settled in the belly of the beast. Assuming him lost to the sea, the crew continued with their whaling expedition, and they happened to catch a good-sized whale. And so when they got it on the deck and started processing it, they were astounded to discover that when they opened up this whale, they found Bartley inside. It had been 36 hours since he had gone overboard. And he was unconscious, but still alive. As a result of the gastric juices and everything, his skin had been bleached uh, was whitish, and apparently he was blind from that day forward. We love the idea of a miracle. We love that idea. And who of you has thought before, you know, it would be just, it would just be wonderful if God would just show some sign. I mean, then we would for sure, for sure believe. I mean, I believe now, but then I would really, really believe. If God would just do some miraculous sign. But we don't know what we wish for. We don't know what we're asking for. Let me ask you, who of you would sign up to experience what Mr. Bartley experienced? He experienced a miracle, did he not? 
Who of you would sign up for three days in a fish? Anybody? Oh, but you want a miracle. You want to know for sure that God is who he says he is. Hey, maybe, maybe you would want to spend your entire life blind so that age 40 or 50, God could heal you and you can suddenly see. Wouldn't you want to do that? Wow, experience a miracle. You're 50 years blind to get it. Would it be worth it? Maybe you'd want to be Naaman, have leprosy, a skin disease that leaves you isolated from those around you, but so that you could experience a miracle and be healed. Would it be worth it? Maybe you would want to see the 10 plagues of Egypt. And all it took for those Jews was 400 years of servitude under Egypt. That's all it required for that miracle to have any meaning. Would you want to trade? Here is the miracle, folks. We are blind to the miraculous care and the sustaining mercy of God who has kept us free from all of these things to this very time. You and I sitting here, we are evidence of the miraculous working of God because we haven't had to spend 40 years in blindness, 90 years hobbling about as cripples. God has sustained us. He has protected us. He has blessed us. And we all sit here as testimonies of the miraculous working of God right now. But you see, the problem with those who seek a sign is that they miss him. It doesn't foster lasting faith. Just like it didn't, just like it doesn't for us, just like it didn't for the Jews. You know, the Jews experienced the ten plagues in Egypt, were led out under the mighty hand of God, treasures heaped upon them by their enemies, the Egyptians, and they take their three-day journey, and on their way, <coughs> ah, it's so dry and hot out here <laughs> in the desert, I need, I need a drink. This was after the Red Sea, I believe. And then three days in, after the Red Sea, their enemies destroyed, their throats were parched, they were thirsty, and they murmured against God, the God who just delivered them. Three days later, three, three days. Oh, God, you can save us from the Egyptians, but you can't even send us a drink. Oh. It didn't foster any lasting faith. And the miracles will not do so for you either. You know, Jesus said, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Look, if you want to see a miracle, look no further than in the mirror. Look no further than in the mirror and recognize the miraculous work, the sustaining work of God in your own life. Think about the grace that he has poured out upon you and look no further, but lift your voice in praise. Believe. Believe that he who has brought you thus far can deliver you to the end and see you through. Believe it. Verse 22, for the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. I shared this a few weeks ago already, but I'm going to share it with you again. It's so good. Acts chapter 17 Beginning at verse 17, Paul is in Athens. Remember, there were three cities, three primary cities in Corinth. They were Athens, or sorry, not in Corinth, in Greece. It was Athens, Corinth, and Sparta. And Corinth divided these two cities of Sparta and Athens, and, and you've heard of them before, right? The, the battle 
Troy, the different things that were going on with Athens and Sparta and a lot of war between them. Corinth was kind of smack dab in the middle. The Greeks seek after wisdom, and Paul was spending some time in Athens, another prominent city. In verse 17 of Acts, chapter 17, this is where we pick up. Paul does what he normally does. He goes to a new town, and he heads straight for the synagogue, that place that is belong, belongs to the Jews. And he was there disputing in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. So he's talking to the Jews, right, the ones who wanted to see miracles all the time. But then, in verse 18, certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics, they encountered her, encountered him there. You know, philosophers are the ones who are seeking wisdom all the time, right? Asking questions and just sit around and talk about all kinds of ideas. And some said, what will this babbler say? Others, some, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him unto Areopagus, that's Mars Hill, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is? For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. And we would know therefore what these things mean. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear of some new thing. Philosophers. So Paul preaches the God of creation and the resurrection. And in verse 32, and when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. And others said, we will hear thee again of this matter. You know, they sat around and they did nothing but to listen to stories, right? So they were looking forward to another story time with Pastor Paul. You know, the wise of this world produce many theories Many ideas, plenty of theory, theoretical, unproven assumptions to replace the need for God. But the answers they supply do not satisfy. They will not satisfy the soul. They will not give rest to your spirit. They will not provide for you peace that passes understanding, a hope that extends beyond you in a grave. They can't. And it makes sense that their hope that all the wisdom of the world doesn't give you anything beyond the, the grave because remember, our ways are like on the earth. That's as far as they can get. In fact, all their wisdom leads to you actually being six feet under the surface of the dirt yet. That's as good as it gets. But God's ways are far higher, eternal in their scope and reach. The wisdom of the world will fail you. And that's why the Greeks stumbled at the preaching of the cross. It didn't make any earthly sense to them. And it makes sense that it didn't, right? Because it's foolishness to them that perish. If you are your own savior, then the preaching of the cross is not going to make any sense to you. It will be no source of hope or comfort to you. But friends, there is no such thing as a do-it-yourself redemption. It just doesn't exist. You cannot save yourself. And maybe, maybe you are like me for a time, for a season in my life where, where you tried very hard to be very good. And you would muster yourself and you would shake yourself and say, okay, now, now from now on, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do good. I'm going to be better. I'm going to stop this and that and this and that is not going to happen again and this is it today is the day and you get a whole three minutes in <laughs> before you fail again and you find that your very best efforts fail you and all of your self-righteousness adds up to stinking rags before God well, I spent plenty of time there there is no such thing as a do-it-yourself redemption Verse 23, but we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. 
but unto them which are called, both those who are Jews as well as the Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Our hope is in the cross, the preaching of the cross, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, our hope into eternity. To those who have hope in God through Jesus Christ, your faith will be rewarded with salvation, eternal life. This is our hope. And it is certainly to the Jews who look for some miraculous sign, the sign of Jesus crucified and dead, is not particularly the kind of sign they're looking for. They want to see demonstrable power of God revealed. Not God ends up dead, nailed to some lumber. That's not quite the big bang they were hoping for. Not the illustrious victory that they were, that they were hoping in. And the Jews, well, it just makes no sense to them. <laughs> the resurrection... I've never known anyone who's come back from the dead. If you're just looking for human understanding, it's never going to compute in your mind. It will not satisfy you. But the foolishness of God, if there was such thing, is wiser than the wisest of men. The weakness of God, if there were such thing, far far outweighs the greatest strength of man. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone, to the, to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Well, friends, you and I fall into that category. You could say to the Jew first, also the Greek, eventually the Mennonite, even we have hope. Even we have hope if we will trust in Christ. Now as we continue here, verse 26, um, I'd like us to consider just for a minute here, have a good look around. Have a good look around, church. Look at, look at the people sitting beside you. Look at the people across from you. Look behind you. Look over your shoulder. Look at everyone. Try to pick out the smartest, wealthiest, strongest, bestest person you can find. Verse 26, For ye see your calling, brethren. He's talking to the Corinthian church here, and he may as well be talking to us. It's no different here in our, in our midst. You see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Many kings in our midst? Any kings here? No? No? You want to say, oh, I'm the king in my house. Okay. <laughs> That's good. But you haven't got royal subjects bowing in your presence. I hope that's not the case. That would be unhealthy in your homes. <laughs> what about any academics, scientists, et cetera, et cetera? Anybody who works for NASA? No, no. What about those who are mighty rulers, leaders, conquerors, generals? No, not many of them here. Politicians? <laughs> no, no, not many of them here. So you see, many of these, unfortunately, who are noble and wise and mighty and so forth, they have sought out a wisdom, but it, sadly for them, uh, is usually not the wisdom of God. And they have chosen a path that leads to a, some effort of self-righteousness on their own. But it is a path that leads to destruction. It is the worldly wisdom that will ultimately fail them. You know that it's good reason. It is good reason that the mighty, noble, and wise are not a part of us, by and large. Not every case, but mostly. 
We see that in verse 27. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base, low, low things, things at the base. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen. Hath God chosen, not hath God all that's left for him. Oh, well, at least I can do something with these yet. No, God chose these of all of the items, among all the wealthy and the noble and the rich and the mighty. God chose, not the noble, the rich, the wealthy, the mighty, the strong. He chose the base, the low, the despised things. This is what he chose. God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, those things which are despised, the base things hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught or to nothing things that are. And why do you suppose that is? I mean, if God had everything to do, look, 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 guys. If you approached everyone's favorite phosphat table, if you approached the phosphat table and you could pick any one item of your choice, you look at all over the whole spread and you think, oh boy, here is good sign. And you're going to pick one item from that phosphat table. Are you going to look across that whole spread and choose the one worst, lowest, despised thing that you can find? Of course not. You and I would choose the pineapple upside down cake. Or whatever it would be. You would choose your favorite. You would choose the best, the tastiest looking, the whatever you would desire. <coughs> but not the Lord. He thinks in ways that are different than the way that we think, right? And good thing he does. It's a good thing he does because that is what has provided for us hope. That is what has provided for us purpose, meaning, in a world that will by and large reject us, in a world where we are viewed as so little, as despised, as nothing, as unesteemed. This is where our opportunity arises. And why do you suppose it is that God chooses those low things? Verse 29, that no flesh should glory in his presence. So that nobody's going to say, hey, God, hey, why don't you partner up with me and we'll get some stuff done around here. I've, I mean, I've got it together here. I've got a far reach and influence. You and I could do some big things together, God. Just come alongside me and partner with me. God has no use for that. God has no use for that. Do you know who God honors? and delights to use? Those who will say, oh God, what am I? Who am I that you would use me? Oh God, I'm so inadequate, what can I offer? Those are the ones that God can use. Those are the ones who are mighty in the hand of a mighty God the ones who look past themselves and look to the Savior who does the work in and through them. That no flesh should glory in his presence. Now here's the work of our Lord. Listen. Listen to what you bring to the table as a child of God. Listen to what you bring to the table and what God does. And let's compare a little bit here. Verse 30. But of him... That's God, referring to God, but of him, of God, are ye, believers, in what? In your own strength, in your own might, in your own glory? No, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus. Oh, oh, okay, so by God, we who believe are in Christ Jesus. Who of God, Jesus Christ, who of God is made unto us 
wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. And redemption. What do we bring to the table in that passage? God, Jesus, righteousness, sanctification, redemption. And we bring nothing. We just receive. We are the recipients. We don't add to the equation. God plus John Jansen. Oh, that's a good big number there. Nothing. Nothing of the sort. There's God and Christ Jesus, and that's the winning combination. That is the correct answer. And I simply receive. That ought to produce in me something, right? Some gratitude, some humility, some God-honoring praise. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us. <laughs> See, we don't produce our own wisdom, redemption, righteousness. Christ is unto us, made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. That, verse 31, the last passage, the last verse in chapter 1, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in everything he brings to the table, in all his might and wisdom and strength, in all his self-righteous goodness, Nope. Let him glory in the Lord. Let him glory in the Lord. You see, those of us who are nothing and view ourselves as nothing are the only ones who don't get in the way of what God is doing. Because we're nothing. You can't block something if you're nothing. The glory has to be the Lord's because the working is of the Lord. It is His. And the Lord is to be glorified. He is worthy of honor and glory. And he has said that he will not share his glory with any man. So if you see yourself as something, if you're really something here this morning, you need to come to the place where you recognize that in all of your somethingness, you're nothing. And if there is anything in you at all, it is as a result of the working of God in and through you. Praise Him as a result. Get out of the way so that God can receive the glory and show Himself strong on your behalf. This is not the wisdom of the world. The wisdom of the world says, get the spotlight at any cost. Make sure you steal the show and are the one that everyone remembers. Make a name for yourself. But you know that each one of those are eventually forgotten? Or if they are remembered, they're remembered for their rotten contribution to the world? There is nothing lasting. But those who have seen that the work is of God and in Christ and have yielded themselves to Christ, I mean, Paul had this funny little saying inspired by the Holy Spirit. He said in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now there is a good recipe for success. There is someone who had true wisdom, wisdom that the world cannot offer. There is someone who did not need to see and recognize or Witness a miracle, he saw that he was a miracle. And the working of God in his life was the miraculous thing. The very resurrection lived out in his own life. It was a new life. He was dead but still alive through Jesus Christ, through the hope of the resurrection. Friends, if you have found peace with God, this is your hope. Hope of the resurrection. Don't be allured by the world. The wisdom of the world will fail you. I mean, that sounds really smart. These guys know what they're talking about. Don't be fooled. Don't be fooled. There is nothing lasting or substantive in what they peddle. Our hope, our hope is in the heavens. 
Our hope is far above anything they can offer us. It is not in signs and wonders. The sign and wonder is what God has worked in our own personal lives and what continues to work in the lives of those around us. You don't need to be mighty and wise. And if God has given you a capacity to do so, oh, do so humbly and in the fear of God. Be very careful that you don't see yourself as more than you are, as more than God sees you as. But recognize that anything you can offer is because of his working in you that which is worthwhile. So we don't need miracles. We don't need the wisdom of the world. We recognize we need God. We need the foolishness of the preaching of the cross. And that's where our hope lies. Amen? Amen. Let's bow together in closing prayer. Our gracious Lord, is it in you? It is in you that we find hope. It is in you that we find comfort and uh, an anchor for our souls. Hope for eternity. The wisdom of the world has failed us. We've tested it. We've tried it. We've tasted it. And it's sorely disappointing. It leaves more questions than it provides answers. And Father, we have at times, it's true, we have desired to see miracles. We have desired to just, oh God, if you would just show yourself once in such a mighty, undeniable way, that would make all the difference. But we've seen again and again and again through the annals of history that those miraculous signs and wonders do not foster a lasting faith. I pray that we might take time to consider your miraculous working in our own lives and how blessed we are that we have not needed to experience all of those things, those horrible, hard, difficult things which miracles have delivered people from. We don't want to. We really don't want to experience that. But rather to enjoy and experience the miracle of your daily provision, your daily sustenance, your grace and protection. For this we are grateful. Thank you for the cross of Christ. This is why we can rejoice in an instrument of death and how it has provided for us ultimately the shedding of Christ's blood and the redemption of our souls, repentance and forgiveness of sins. Thank you, Lord. We are grateful. In Jesus' name, amen.